All right, so what we're doing today is we're looking at how Stirling's formula implies the central limit theorem, at least in a special case. And the idea here is to start building up some intuition as to why the central limit theorem is true. So what does the central limit theorem study? What are we studying in the central limit theorem? <coughs> Not good, come on. Somebody speak up. I'm going to have to stop giving pop quizzes. What are we studying in the central limit thing? What's the key quantity? I'm sorry? Expected value of what? It's not, it's not actually the expected value. It's close to that. The average of a large number of um, what they, uh, random variables. Random variables thank you. Large, so we're averaging a large number of independent, identically distributed random variables. With a lot of work, you can remove the independent. I'm sorry, you can remove the uh, identical. The independent is we're stuck with. What would be the easiest random variable to study? I won't let you study it, but the easiest one. Yes. The normal distribution. No, much much easier than normal. Uniform. Much easier than uniform. Or oh, very special uniform. Yes? Say it out loud. <laughs> you, can't, you can't be empty. I'm going to assign probability to something. Zero all the time. Zero all the time, right? If I give you the probability distribution that is zero all the time, that is not that hard to study. And I can understand sums of zero all the time very well. I, I will not let you study something that's zero all the time. So what's the next easiest thing to study? <laughs> That's essentially the same thing. So you've got to be a little bit different than one all the time. Zero half the time and one the other half the time. So the question is, I want to take on two values. Now the difficulty is, which two values do I want to take on? It's technically easier to be minus one half the time and one half the time. So think of this as a coin. And if you're going to assign probabilities, what would be the easiest probability to assign for the coin? One half. So we're going to study sums of a fair coin. So a head will be plus one and a tail will be minus one. And we'll toss two n times. And the reason we'll toss two n times is now the possibilities for the net number of heads is going to be an even number. So we'll let xi equal outcome on toss i, and we'll study y2n is x1 plus x2n. So what do we believe that this should be? What kind of distribution should this look like? Normal. Normal. What would be the mean? Zero, zero, zero. Good. And this is because the expected value of a sum is the sum of the expected values. So if it's going to be a normal, the only normal it could possibly be is a mean zero. What about the variance? Let's say that this has variance sigma. What would be the variance if this has variance sigma, or variance sigma squared? And sigma squared. And sigma squared. So if this has variance sigma squared, the variance here would be n sigma squared. Does everyone agree with that? It's not quite n sigma squared. 2n. 2n. So we're going to have to be worrying about these factors of 2 all day. But I think it's easier to have an even number of tosses. And so all my outcomes are going to be even numbers. I could easily divide by 2 later for things. So now we just need to figure out what is sigma squared. Well, sigma squared, half the time, I'm 1 minus 0 squared. And half the time, I'm negative 1 minus 0 squared. Right? This is how you calculate the variance. The mean of each xi is 0, so I get 1 half of 1 squared plus 1 half of 1 squared, which is just 
one. So the variance is going to just be 2n. Okay, so we have an idea of the limiting distribution. So it should be 1 over square root of 2 pi, the variance is 2n, e to the negative x squared over 2 times 2n. That's what it should be converging to in the limit. Now we're going to have a little bit of a difficulty. We had this difficulty when we looked at the Poisson and the central limit theorem last time. The Poisson was discrete. And so we had to say, well, the probability that the Poisson takes on the value n, that's really the same as comparing the limiting normal between n minus a half and n plus a half. All right, so what I want to do is I want to go through some of the calculation. Uh, it's going to depend on how awake you all look as to exactly how far we get with it. But the full details are in the book. And so I don't feel bad if I skip a few of the steps. But there is a subtlety. And I will deliberately make a mistake at one point and probably accidentally make a mistake at two or three other points. So be alert. Try to find where I am making the mistakes. Okay? So what is the probability that y2n equals m? What kind of m should I be looking at? You know, should m be square root of 2? Would that be a good m to investigate? No. Okay, so what m should I look at? Um, evens. Evens. So rather than calling this m, what should I really call this? 2m. 2m. Because I know the probability that it equals an odd number is 0. All right, well, what's the probability that it equals 2m? So how would I have 2m? I have some number of heads and some number of tails, and I have a net of 2m. So every head is plus 1, every tail is minus 1. How many heads do I have? So, you have 2m plus the number of tails. I have 2m more heads than tails. So if, I, so if h is the number of heads, h plus 2m plus, I'm sorry. So the number of tails plus 2m plus the number of tails would equal 2m. Plus the number of heads. This is the number of heads. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Or I could write it as heads yeah. plus the number of heads minus 2m equals 2m. And I can use this to solve for the number of heads and the number of tails. So if I use this, I get 2h minus 2m equals 2n. So I get h is equal to n plus m, and similarly I get tails is equal to n minus m. So that's how many heads I have, that's how many tails I have. All right, so what's the probability that I have exactly 2m heads? So I've got to have, I'm sorry, exactly 2m net. I've got n plus m heads, n minus m heads. I'm tossing a fair coin 2n times. What would that probability be? It's been a while since we've done it, but math is cumulative. Yes. Should be a binomial. Should be a binomial. So which binomial? <laughs> so what's the top of the binomial? Yes. 2n over, or choose either n plus n or n minus 7 plus n. Right. Right. Of course, we discriminate. We prefer heads to tails. We always do everything relative to heads. Okay. Yes. Okay. What else do I have to put in? Since probability half, you can just do a half to the 2n. Yes, if I don't put a half in there, this is absurd, because this number is going to be way greater than 1, typically. All right. So we have a 1 over 2 to the 2n. All, right. All we have to do now is show that this essentially is converging to the standard normal. Well, not a standard normal, sorry. It's converging to a normal we have not adjusted to have mean 0 variance 1. What do you think would be useful for studying this binomial coefficient? Sterling's formula. Right? There's a reason why we've just spent a lot of time on Sterling's formula and we're moving directly into this. And there's a reason why this section is called Sterling implies central limit theorem. Okay? So, how big do you think m is relative to n? Do you think m is as big as n or much smaller? Much smaller. The f we expect to have zero net heads. So, we expect m to be zero. 
the variance is of size 2m, the standard deviation is of size square root of 2m. Even if you use something weak, what's a weak theorem we could use to talk about probability of being far away from the mean? Chebyshev, right? We could use Chebyshev and say, what's the probability that m is as large as n to the 3 quarters? So for instance, if m is roughly of size n to the 3 fourths, <coughs> this is n to the 1 quarter times n to the 1 half. This means we're talking about something like n to the 1 quarter standard deviations away. I'm not worrying about factors of 2. Okay? If m is as large as n to the 3 quarters, then I would be n to the 1 quarter standard deviations away. How probable does Chebyshev say that is? So if your k standard deviations away, Chebyshev says the probability is at most 1 over k squared. So Chebyshev, the probability is less than approximately 1 over n to the 1 half. Okay. So it's extremely unlikely if n is large that m is as big as n to the 3 quarters. In fact, Chebyshev is being incredibly generous to say that the probability could be as large as 1 over square root of n. The probability is far more minuscule than that. But this is enough to tell us that when we're looking at this, we really expect m is about of size 0. So in other words, n is going to be much, much larger than m. Okay? So that's going to help us when we're trying to expand things. m is going to be small, n is going to be large. Okay. <coughs> so let's start analyzing this. So the first is to write out the binomial coefficients. So we get 2n factorial over n plus m factorial n minus m factorial <coughs> 1 over 2 to the 2n. Right. The 1 over 2 to the 2n is just going to be along for the ride for a long time. Okay? All right. So the first is the 2n factorial is going to be 2n to the 2n, then e to the negative 2n, then the square root of 2 pi times 2n. Right. Leave plenty of room. Okay? n plus m will be n plus m to the n plus m n minus m to the n minus m, e, I'm going to save myself a little time, I get an e to the negative n plus m and e to the negative n minus m. What are those combined to give me? e to the negative 2n, square root of 2 pi n plus m, square root of 2 pi n minus m, and 2 to the 2n. Okay, just made it. Yes? I'm just expanding out the factorials. Where are square roots going? Stirling's formula. You know, n factorial is n to the n, e to the minus n, square root of 2 pi n. And so technically I should put an approximately equal. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Question or? <clears throat> no, no, I'm just remembering reading this, so I'm not going to write it down. Yeah. Like yeah, and I'm saying if you guys don't want to write this down, by all means, just sit back, relax, and try to enjoy the ride. You know, it's all in the book. Okay? There's some cancellations we can do. What's an obvious cancellation? E to the minus 2n. Yeah, the e to the minus 2n is quickly canceled. Anything else? Can you cancel the 2 to the Yeah, I have a 2 to the 2n and a 2 to the 2n. Those cancel. I can cancel the n to the 2n. If I pull an n out of here and an n out of here. Okay. <coughs> and I can cancel some of the 2 pi's. I can cancel this 2 pi with a 2 pi down here. Okay. n plus m and n, are these about the same if n is large? It's just one term. So I can cancel this n plus m with this n over here. I can cancel the square root of 2 with the square root of 2 down here. Wait, did you, did you cancel that right. n with n or n plus m? I did it with n plus m. Because it's just one term. m is going to be less than n to the 3 quarters. So I've got a square root of n over square root of n plus something but most <coughs> size n to the 3 fourths. n plus m is essentially n. 
If you want, look at it as n over n plus m <coughs> is, plot the n, it's 1 over 1 plus m over n. n is less than n to the 3 quarters. This is really close to 1. So the error in replacing this with 1 is negligible. So I can do that for one factor. If I had this to the nth power, all bets are off. Because now this is a little bit more than 1, but I'm taking it to a huge number of power. Now it could all of a sudden you know, come back and bite me. It's a technical term. I swear I'm not asking this to be offensive. <laughs> okay. As I said, but you mentioned at the beginning of probability. Right. Like that, you know, as you sort of you progress with mathematics, you get a little bit more cavalier with some of the assumptions. Far more cavalier, not a little bit. Far more, far more Would this be an example of a little bit of sort of like... Cause it just seems like, you know, you said at most three quarters. If it was, you mentioned that it's exceedingly unlikely. It should be shown it's very, being very generous. Right. You know, we're three quarters. That would be a significant difference from... Right. I, I, don't expect, I don't expect M to be as large as M to the three quarters. I could really show that M is at most, you know, square root of N times log of N. I'm being overly generous by saying, imagine M could get as large as N to the three quarters. Okay. And even in that ridiculous case, I'm still okay. It's extremely unlikely for M to be that large. Okay. You know, N is going off to infinity. So the probability that M is at least N to the three quarters is going to be significantly smaller. Okay. And so over here, with just one term, I'm okay. So now let's see what happens after all the dust has settled. Now, so Why I cancel n plus m rather than n minus m? Aren't they both essentially n? Yeah, I mean, if you want, I can cancel the n minus m if you'd rather. Okay, that's just what I'm In fact, yeah, let, let, on the next line, let's replace the n minus m with just n. Because it's just one term. So for one term, I can basically do whatever I want. <laughs> for multiple terms, if I raise the terms to a huge number of powers, I can't do this. But for one term, the error is negligible. You're good. Think of it as, it's your lucky day, you just won a quadrillion dollars in the lottery. And now, unfortunately, you're told you have to pay a million dollars in taxes. And then you, you're writing out the check, and it's, oh, I'm sorry, it was actually one million and fifty dollars in taxes. Do you really care? Would you even care if it was two million dollars? No. The error is so small, it doesn't really matter. And so over here, the effect of one term is going to be insignificant. You know, I can keep track of that error. The difficulty here is, this is not m. This is not just n. It's n plus m to the n plus m. So if I'm a little bit off in here, I can't just drop the m and call that n to the n plus m. Because now, even though m is small relative to n, I'm raising it to a huge power. And so what do I get? The only thing that remains up top, actually nothing remains up top. The entire top is gone. What happens to the n plus n? What happened to the n to the 2n? Yeah. I'm pulling out an n from here, and I'm pulling out an n from there. So the first one is I get 1 plus m over n to the negative n plus m. It's in the denominator, so I'm writing it as a negative n plus m. The next one is 1 minus m over n to the negative n minus m. Now what's left over? This is gone, this is all gone. We said we're going to replace this with 1 over square root of pi n. Okay? So after the dust settles, this is where we are. And recall the limit as, I'm running out of letters, uh, we'll use big M goes to infinity of 1 plus t over m to the m. This is e to the t. If you've seen compound interest, this is another nice way of defining e to the t, or e to the x. m is much smaller than n. So approximately what power am I raising this to? To the n. And so now, oh look, I have 1 plus m over n to the n. What does that go to? E to, the, e to the m. And what does the next term go to? E to the minus m. 1 over square root of pi n. And after I do some algebra, what does this become? 
1 over what's that? Yeah, 1 over root pi n. So who's happy with this answer? Not one person is happy with this answer? Why is this answer bad? It doesn't depend on m. It does not depend on m. Okay. Clearly, we must have done something wrong. Right? What this is telling us is the probability is independent of m. So it's converging to a uniform distribution. Okay. So either every book on the central limit theorem is wrong, or we did something wrong here. And there are a couple of places that you can yell at mode. So where should where should you really concentrate your anger? <coughs> so I deliberately wanted to do this to see if I could slip it by you. I had a physics professor in college who I believe could approximate away special relativity and justify it in such a way that none of us would really notice until the very end. Where was the illegal step? When you for the n plus m, maybe in the... When I basically covered up the little m? Yeah. Yes. Why is that illegal? Because it's in the... Even if it's not that big, you're raising something to that power. Well, m... How big do you expect m to be? On average, we expect m to be zero, but how big do you expect m to be? What's the scale? No, no, no. We know it's not going to be larger than m to the three quarters. Now, we use Chebyshev to show the probability it's greater than n to the three quarters is negligible, because we can write three quarters as n to the three quarters as n to the quarter times n to the half. So that means we were about n to the quarter standard deviations away. How big do you expect m to be? We expect it to be zero, and what are the fluctuations in the size of m? Root two n. Root two n, or root n, just to be informal. Okay, that root two is not going to cause problems. Don't worry. We expect m to be of size root n. When I drop that root n, I've got one plus m over n to the root nth power. That's a little bit too cavalier to just replace that with e to the m. And then, of course, if that was wrong, this is probably wrong as well. So up to here, we're fine. But from here to here, this is one of the most common mistakes people make. Is they say, well, look, this isn't that big, so I can just ignore that. All right, so what I want to do now is I want to spend a few minutes and talk about how would you actually approximate these well. So does anybody have any idea of what technique we should use to understand 1 plus m over n to the negative n plus n? And of course, the negative sign doesn't matter. I can just take a reciprocal later. What technique should I use? What should I do? Take the log. Take the log, excellent. I'm debating buying a little bell to just... Why should I take a log? It gets rid of the exponent, or it brings the exponent down. Good. What do we have? Because we have this exponent, what does this really have? Product. It's a product, right? It's a product. Whenever you see a product, take a logarithm. Okay. All right, maybe if you're helping a younger cousin learning the multiplication <laughs> and doing you know, what's three times four, well, that's the same as log of three plus log of four. Okay, that's probably one of the only times I will not advise you to take logarithms. Other than that, if you see a product, take logarithms. I did not write the green chicken exam this year, so I don't know if the people there have the same view. But so let's let um, p one equal one plus m over n to the n plus n. And we'll put in the negative sign later. So the log of p1, well actually, do you want to do both of them at the same time? Let's do both of them at the same time. Let's put an epsilon there. And if we put an epsilon there, if epsilon is 1, we get the first fact. If epsilon is uh, minus 1, we get the second factor. So we need to change this over here to epsilon m. Epsilon is at minus one one. And this way we can do the two different algebra things at the same time. Okay? So now the log of P1, instead of calling it P1, let's call it P epsilon. So notation is really good. This way we can minimize how much notation, how much algebra we're doing. This is going to be n plus epsilon m, the log of one plus epsilon m over n. 
Okay. This is n plus epsilon m. And now when I expand the logarithm, uh, recall <coughs> the log of 1 plus u is u minus u squared over 2 <coughs> plus u cubed over 3 minus u to the fourth over 4. So this is going to be epsilon m over n minus epsilon squared m squared over 2n plus epsilon cubed m cubed over 3n cubed minus dot dot dot. Okay? So when we look at this, let's try to see how big things are going to be. If m could be as large as n to the 3 quarters, how bad could m cubed be? So if n is of, so if m is of size n to the 3 fourths, m cubed is of size n to the 9 fourths. And so when I multiply by n, I'll get n to the 13 fourths. If I divide by n cubed, ah, crap, that's 12 fourths. So if I used the crude bound that m was at most n to the 3 quarters, then I would have to be paying attention to this term as well. So I would have to refine my estimate and say, could m really be as large as n to the 3 quarters? Well, how likely is it to be as large as n to the 3 quarters? That was 1 over square root of n. So I could do a little bit better. Rather than doing 3 fourths, what could I do? <clears throat> so I don't want to have to deal with this term. I want to say this term is really small, even when I multiply it by a big number like n. And unfortunately, I can't quite say it's really small. Because if m is as large as n to the 3 quarters, n times m cubed divided by n cubed could be as large as n to the 1 quarter. So I need m to be smaller than n to the 3 fourths. So instead of doing m to the 3 fourths, what could I do? Well, if I do n to the half, unfortunately, I expect m to be as large as n to the half. Right? My standard deviation is of size square root of n. So I need a number greater than a half. What's the number greater than a half? So instead of doing 3 fourths, what could I try? I could try 2 thirds. 2 thirds will still cause me a little bit of trouble. If I do 2 thirds, then m cubed would be of size n squared. n times n squared divided by n cubed is just too big. So instead of doing 2 thirds, what could I try? I'm sorry? 4 fifths is going the wrong way. It's making me too large. I could try 3 fifths. Yes? What is our criteria for n being too big? When I, when I multiply it by n, I don't want this term to be large. Right. What are we defining as large? Something that's growing with n. I want something that's tending to zero with n. I don't want to have to deal with all these terms in the Taylor series. I want to be able to stop after two terms. So over here, if m is as large as n to the 3 quarters or even n to the 2 thirds, I'm going to still have to worry about those terms. I want to do as little work as possible. So if I try n to the 2 thirds, it could just barely contribute. If I try 3 fifths, I would be okay. You could do better than 3 fifths. You could do 5 eighths. You know, anything greater than a half will work. So if I do um, m is at most n to the 3 fifths, um, then m cubed would be n to the 9 fifths, and then n times m cubed over n cubed, all right, 9 fifths plus 1 is 14 fifths, divided by n cubed is 1 over n to the 1 15th. All right, I win. Okay? All I need is to have a positive power in the denominator, and this term will go to 0 as n gets large and it won't matter. Well, if this term goes to zero, what about the next term? It's going to go to zero even faster. I'm going to have like a geometric series in terms of m over n. What about Chebyshev? 
Well, if I look at this, I can write m as n to the, okay, 3 fifths. This is why I wanted to do uh, 5 eighths rather than 3 fifths. Uh, this is 1 half times n to the 1 tenth. So by Chebyshev, the probability that m is this is larger than this is 1 over n to the 2 tenths. It's still very unlikely. So Chebyshev, the probability m is greater than or equal to n to the 3 fifths is less than or equal to roughly 1 over n to the 2 tenths. So it's very unlikely that I'm going to have such a large number. Okay. So initially, you know, we chose m to be at most three quarters. That was just an easy thing to do. But as we did more analysis, it turned out that that was uh, too quick. Of course, one could say, well, what if we use something better than Chebyshev? It wasn't Chebyshev that was giving us issues. It was Taylor expanding the logarithm and trying to understand what does this product look like. And the difficulty was that, unfortunately, this term could still be contributing if m was as large as n to the 3 quarters. That's why we have to truncate it a bit. So now we'll assume m is at most n to the 3 fifths, and we're okay. All right, so now we don't really need these other terms. So if we take the two epsilons, we get the log of p1 is basically n plus m Epsilon m, oops, epsilon is 1, so we get m over n minus m squared over 2n plus, oh, that should be 2 n squared, plus dm small. It's another technical term, right? That's going to have a large power of n, so large that even when I multiply by n, it's small. That's why it's not just small, okay? What about the log of p minus 1? What would that be approximately? I'm sorry? N minus M, good. What next? Yep. We don't flip all the signs. So this becomes negative M over N minus M squared over 2M plus M small. Uh, <laughs> Dim is actually unsigned. <laughs> also over n squared. Oh, also over n squared. Yeah. If I keep dropping the squares, which will be really bad for me. <laughs> okay, so now all we have to do is add them. <coughs> right? <coughs> so when we add, the n times this and the n times this, they cancel. The m times this and the negative m times this, they reinforce. Right? And so when we add them, we get m squared over n times 2, right? <coughs> now let's look at the next term. These both have negative signs, so the m here and the negative m here cancel, and the n's reinforce. And when the n's come in, the n squared's become a 1 over n, right? <coughs> and we have two of them, so we get minus m squared over n. Well, what's 2m squared over n minus m squared over n? m squared over n. Okay, so we're going to have to play some games with this in a little bit. Because we're not going to actually want to write the denominator, it's just n. Any idea how we want to write the denominator? <coughs> n plus n. Because I mean, it doesn't matter. No. So this is important. How should I write big N? I don't want to write big N as N. So I've already taken a product. I've already done one of my favorite things. Multiply by one. Multiply by one. How should I multiply by one? So there's been a fact I've been dropping through and saying, oh, it doesn't really matter when we use Chubby Chubb. What's the standard deviation? Or what's the variance? 2n. 2n. When we have an exponential, when we have a Gaussian, it should be divided by 2 times the variance. 
I want a variance of 2n. I should write this as m squared over 2n to the factor of 1 half. Okay? And so now when I go back, and now I put this all in, I have these two terms here. These two terms here became this. Well, that's the logarithm, so I have to exponentiate. So I get e to the negative m squared divided by 1 half times 2n times 1 over square root of pi n. Well, I should write this maybe as 1 half times 2. We're almost there. All right. Wait, where did... This was the logarithm. We, 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 oh, we, yeah, so yeah. when I exponentiate, I'm almost there. What don't you like? We're calculating the probability y of 2n equals 2m. And what do we have? We have in terms of n. We have in terms of m and not in terms of 2m. How can I make m look like 2m? Multiplied by 1. Multiplied by 1. Right? Yeah. Multiply by 4 times 1 fourth. If I multiply this by 4, this becomes 2m squared. The 4 comes down below. <gasps> 4 times 1 half is 2. <laughs> now that's really <laughs> 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 It's very unlikely most people will be so excited about it. And now we have 1 over... I'm going to multiply by 2 over 2. And if I multiply by 2 over 2, the 2 coming inside the square root becomes a 4. And we'll have a 2 over here. And we'll have a square root of 2 pi times 2n. OK? <coughs> Does that look like a Gaussian with mean 0 and variance 2n? Or is there something that's slightly different between this and a normal Gaussian? Normal Gaussian is a horrible phrase. Does this look slightly different than a Gaussian with mean 0 and variance 2n? The extra 2. Why is the extra 2 not a problem? I'm sorry? It's negligible. Who is not negligible to 1? It's getting built compared to the denominator. Well, but I'm saying if I have a Gaussian, if I just multiply by 2, I've now got a probability of 2. I mean, I would love if the Red Sox have a 200% chance of winning the World Series next year, but that's not going to happen. Yeah, I'm sorry? Well, that's why I have a 2N over here. Uh, yes. Because they all have to be positive. What has to be positive? Um, I could have a negative net number oh, of heads. Yeah. Okay. It's not, but too close. It's not because they have to be positive, but it's something related to that. They have to be evens. So what's the probability that y2n equals 2n plus 1? Zero. So I'm basically spreading out the normal's probability. And that's where this extra factor 2 is coming from. It's coming from the fact that the odds have zero probability. So I've got to basically double the probability at the evens to make up for the fact that the probability of the odds is zero. Okay, yes. Okay, so this is because of the odds. Odds have zero probability. Okay. So this is a proof of the central limit theorem in the special case of tossing a fair coin. We could actually do even better. We can actually isolate out an error term. If I had just kept, instead of writing things like damn small, if I had just kept track of what the error was and not been so lazy. Don't the odds cancel? They don't cancel completely because I have an n plus m and an n minus m. I almost used that. I was actually thinking about that live during the lecture. So wait, I don't really care about this. Three fourths will be okay. Oh, sure. But good thing to try. Shucks. Yes, that's a much politer way to say it. Okay. So this is the special case, assuming we know Sterling. And unfortunately, this only works if the probability of a head and a tail is one half. To try to modify this to general p is hard. Okay? There are many reasons why I want to spend so much time on this proof. Okay? 
It is not because I have to fill up enough lecture material for an entire semester. Probability is a fun, vast area. There is plenty of stuff to do. The question is, why am I doing this to you? you know, why did I want to spend about you know, 40 plus minutes on this? A couple of reasons. One, I like the fact that it's very easy to try to slip something by you. <laughs> I've had things slipped by me as well, especially in papers I'm referring to. Uh, where you try and see, well, let me just cavalierly estimate. You've got to be careful. So one of the reasons I like this is it talks about how should we handle large products. What's the correct way to analyze that? The other thing is, hopefully this has drilled into you that you never want to do this again. Right? That you want a better method to attack other sums of random variables. You don't want to have to go through this kind of proof. So hopefully this will be motivation for... Uh, the generating function approach we're going to do. Okay, any questions before we change topics? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I actually worked with OIT a couple of years ago to make a video number from the Fibonacci numbers to uh, roulette. And so I will give you a link for that, you know, you'll to watch that before Monday's class. Okay, if you want to try to go down and, you know, gamble uh, do not do that until you watch the video, okay? And you'll see why you are not supposed to do that. So this is a way to try to free up a little bit of extra time in the semester. I want to talk now about generating functions. And so, given a sequence a n can define a function g a I think the book likes to use S, and I should be careful because the book is me. Um, <laughs> is the sum of a n s to the n. Usually, there'll be a finite sum, or n goes from 0 to infinity. What's the first question you should ask when you see a generating function? So you've just met a generating function, what do you want to ask it? I'm oh, sorry? Does it converge? Does it converge? Right? I haven't told you what the A's are from. So a good question might be, which A's should we use to create a generating function? That's a great question to ask. So can anybody give me a value where the generating function converges? The ANs are all zero. So I'm not so <laughs> <laughs> that's giving me a sequence oh, with the generating function. Okay. You know. I want you to give me a value where the generating function converges. S equals zero. S equals zero. So no matter what, the I generating function shall converge <laughs> at S equals zero. It's really not that impressive to converge at S equals zero. It's like telling you your Taylor series converges at X equals zero. You know, big deal. It turns out if there is a small neighborhood about the origin where the generating function converges, you can deduce a lot of things. So we will see later on that this is not the best version of a generating function. There are other versions which are more tractable for analysis. Interestingly, the most useful version of the generating function turns out to involve the square root of minus 1. And when you put in the square root of minus 1, you force things to converge a lot better. What do you think the ANs will often be? You know, based on the title of this class. Probability densities. Probability densities. So let's take like a Poisson. So if we take Poisson with parameter lambda, then a n is lambda to the n, e to the minus lambda over n factorial. So g lambda of s would be the sum, n goes from 0 to infinity, of lambda to the n, e to the minus lambda over n factorial. Anything else? S to the n. Times S to the n. Now, when you look at this, a natural way to rewrite this 
I can even call it e to the minus lambda if I want. It's s lambda to the n over n factorial. Right, all I've done is I've just put s with lambda. They're both raised to the nth power. Why not have them hang out? Okay? Now that they're hanging out, what do you think? Can you evaluate this? So what does it equal? So g lambda of s is e to the minus lambda, the sum, and goes from 0 to infinity of lambda times s to the n over n factorial. What's that sum equal? E to the lambda s. E to the lambda s. So this is just e to the negative lambda, e to the negative lambda s. Yeah, well, if I put those together, it's e to the negative um, 1, I think s minus 1 times lambda. Or was it s plus 1? s plus 1 lambda? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, there's, no way, there's, there's no negative sign there. There's no negative sign there. It's e to the lambda times s minus 1. So this is the generating function of a Poisson. Okay. Now, the question is, who cares about the generating function of a Poisson? <laughs> okay. It turns out that if you know the generating function, you can deduce a lot of things about the random variable you care about. You'll be able to get its mean, you'll be able to get its variance, you'll be able to get all of its moments. There's a version, though, that's a little bit more tractable for calculating moments. It's called the moment generating function. And the name is hopefully clear. Okay. It just makes the algebra a little bit nicer. We've seen this many times during the semester that one way of doing the calculation is worse than another. The generating function is not the greatest for some of the calculations in probability, so we have the moment generating function. So what if I took two Poissons and multiplied the generating functions? I would get e to the lambda 1, s minus 1, e to the lambda 2, s minus 1. So what is that equal to? So I've got lambda 1, lambda 2, so I'll have just e to the lambda 1 plus lambda 2, s minus 1. Do you know any generating function that is e to the lambda 1 plus lambda 2 times s minus 1? Any random variable that might have that as its generating function? Poisson. Poisson. Yeah. yeah. This is just the generating function of Poisson with parameter lambda 1 plus lambda 2. What lemma that we've already proved this semester do you think this is screaming at us? So what lemma did we have involving Poisson's that this kind of reminds us of? The sum of two Poisson's is Poisson. Poisson plus Poisson is Poisson. Right? Here's one way to prove it. It's through the generating functions. So what you want to do is you want to show that the generating function is unique. That two different probability <coughs> distributions cannot have the same generating function. Sadly, that fact is false. But it is true for nice discrete random variables. So on Monday's class, we will talk about generating functions. We'll talk about <coughs> what is the generating function unique and how we can use this to prove that Poisson plus Poisson is Poisson. And we'll be able to do this without having to do the clever algebra where we had to figure out, oh, wait a minute, I can rewrite the factorials this way and add this by multiplying by 1 and regroup and see that Poisson plus Poisson is Poisson. So we'll see another way to do this without having to be as clever. Okay, and again, if anybody has not signed up for the green chicken,